that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have touched. Welcome to the Amazing Collection, the Bible for Women book by book, and I am so glad you could join us today. If you have your Bibles in front of you, if you would open to the book of Hosea, that's the book we're going to be looking at. Well, the wedding was beautiful. The groom stood at the top of the aisle, his face just radiant with love. He was handsome, wealthy, wonderful reputation in the community. And as that beautiful bride started down the aisle, the whole room just seemed to be filled with their love for one another. And I must say, as we left that wedding and that wonderful celebration, every one of us thought, this is a match made in heaven. Because we felt they were so perfect for each other and their love was so pure and beautiful. Ten years later, and several children, he came home one day and found another man in his bedroom. And it was devastating. She was sorry. She cried and pleaded for his love again, said it would never happen. And he believed her and he forgave her and he brought her back into his love. One year later, again he came home and that same man was in his house and again, she pleaded his forgiveness, begged that he would take her back, that it would never happen again. And because he loved her so much, he brought her back into the marriage. A third time, he discovered that she had not gotten rid of her lover and he could bear it no more. His heart was broken. And he said, that is enough. And the marriage ended. It is a story that happens a lot today. We hear about it almost weekly. One person or one movie star or even a friend or even in our own home. And we can't help but hear such a story without feeling a sense of loss, a sense of pain, because adultery is one sin that causes the heart to simply shatter in a million pieces. As we enter into marriage, what we are entering into is a covenant relationship where we give our heart, our minds, our souls, and our bodies to the one we love. And when unfaithfulness happens, it is heart-wrenching. As we open the book of Hosea today, we are going to see a picture of adultery. And God is going to show us a man and a woman who face that crisis in their marriage. But what God is doing is showing us a picture of how he feels about us when we go after other idols, other things that takes our love away from the living God. It is painful and it destroys. This is a very sad, tragic book. And yet, in the sadness and in the sorrow, you are going to get a picture of a God whose love for you is far greater than you could ever imagine. The book was written by Hosea, and he, he is the main character. It is the first of the Minor Prophets. It is the longest of any book in the Minor Prophets. There were only two prophets who spoke to the northern kingdom of Israel, and that was Hosea and Amos. And they spoke during the last 40 years of the existence of that nat nation. You see, God was 
trying to get their attention, trying to get them to turn their hearts and their minds from other gods and back to Him. It is God's abnormal action to bring about destruction, and He will do everything He can to prevent that from happening. And that's what He was doing with this nation of Israel. It is a book where Hosea is begging the people to turn so there would be no judgment. How is Christ concealed in this book? You will see that Hosea redeems his wife from slavery. He buys her back. And yet our Lord and Savior bought us back. He redeemed us with his own life. It is a wonderful picture in this little book. Before you can understand the book, you're going to have to understand what was going on in Israel at this time. So we're going to have a little history lesson. First of all, there was a marriage. You may not have seen it as that, but back in the book of Exodus, remember God brought his people out of Egypt, and he brought them across the Red Sea, and he brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai. And there, in so many words, he said to the people, I would like for us to enter into a covenant agreement like marriage. You see, marriage is not a contract. It is a covenant agreement. And when two people agree and the covenant takes place, it may not be broken. And so God asked his people, come and join me in a covenant relationship. I will be your God and you will be my people. In so many words, I will be your husband and you will be my bride. And the people said, yes, count me in. And as we have watched these people through all of the kingdom books, one thing we have seen is they are not faithful people. It's interesting how when you get married, you really have to put aside your boyfriends. I remember I got married and we went on our honeymoon and I came home and spent one night at my parents' house before we were going on to our real home. And I got a call from a young man that I had dated as a friend off and on and he called me. He had no idea I was married. And he asked if I wanted to go to the movies that night. I have to confess to you, it was the greatest shock to me that I couldn't go to the movies. I had to realize I was married now and I could not date other men. You see, God did not want these people to date other idols, to have other gods. He was to be their only God. And yet they went a-whoring. It seemed like we went through cycles where they would love God greatly and he would pour his blessings out on them. And then they would turn from him and start following some false idols and he would bring about discipline. What God had to offer his people was two things, light and love. You see, he gave them light through his law, through his promises and through his presence. He showed them the path that they should go, a path that would lead to happiness and blessings. And he gave his love. He provided their every need. He protected them from their enemies. You see, he gave them all they needed. And yet what they wanted was to be able to enjoy their own sin. And so they went a-whoring and they became prostitutes adulterers. How did that adultery, that spiritual adultery, manifest itself? You remember Margie said, as the leader goes, so goes the people. I want to just give you a little glimpse of what was happening in this nation during the time that Hosea was prophesying, which was about 755 to about 710. He, he was there about, about close to 50 years. He was speaking to the people. But let's look what happened there. When he came on the scene, Jeroboam II was the king. And I want to tell you that he was, the, he was probably the smartest, wisest, best king Israel ever ha had. He did not love God, but he was pretty smart. And for 41 years, he, he led those people into prosperity. Their, their borders expanded. There was, uh, they were quite powerful. They were very prosperous. And if you would have stopped by the nation at that time, you would have thought they had everything. And they thought they had everything, too. 
And yet while he was king, though it appeared that they were religious, oh, they were still offering the sacrifices and having a show of loving God, their hearts were far from God. So they would worship God a little bit, and then they would worship all of their other idols too. When he died, his son came on the throne. His name was Zechariah, and he only reigned six months, and he was murdered by Shalem. Shalem came on the throne. He was there only one month, and he was murdered by Menahem. Menahem came on the throne. He reigned for 10 years. Now, this will give you a little bit of an idea of how deep in sin and mire and filth this nation had gotten. Menahem got irritated with one of the small towns. He marched into town, and his men ripped open the stomachs of pregnant women. Now, for a man in an army situation to do this to a woman who's at her very weakest time is a horrible atrocity. It's not soldier against soldier. It is absolute the depths of perversion, and this is right where this nation had sunk to. It just gives you a picture of the horror and misery of where they were. Menahan died of natural causes after about 10 years, and then Pekahiah came on board. He was there two years, and he was murdered. Are you getting kind of a gist of what's happening to the nation here? Pekah came on board. He was there 20 years. He was murdered by Hoshea. So you see, there was just such crime, such violence, such horror in the land, because when man turns away from God and his laws, he will sink into deep sin. And the whole nation suffered. When Hoshea was king, God had had enough. And Assyria came down, put a siege around Samaria, and we all know what a siege is. That siege lasted three years. For three years, the people were locked in. They were starving. They were dying. And remember, it is famine, pestilence, and the sword. And in the end, the wall was broken down. Assyria came in and took the Israelites, those who were left, to Assyria, and they scattered them. And that was the end of the northern kingdom. God had warned them. And he is speaking now through a man, Hosea. When Jeroboam was king, Hosea was asked by God to do something that is... Very hard to understand, but remember when we were in, in uh, Jeremiah, I told you that so often a prophet was asked to do something that was hard to understand and hard to do. Because Hosea is going to have to be a living example of what God is trying to show the people. So God comes to Hosea and he asks him to take a wife who is a harlot. Now, Think about this. Hosea is a young man looking to a future where he can take a bride and he can have a family and he can have children and he can have the joys of marriage and God asks him to do something that he knows will leave him with a broken heart for the rest of his life. Because what God wanted to do is to say to the people, look at how you are breaking my heart. Isn't it interesting that every sin brings about misery? But adultery has a misery that I think is probably the greatest. When you enter into marriage, you do enter into an unusual relationship. Usually, hopefully, it's a relationship of trust. And you give your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, you share your deepest, deepest parts of you with the person you love. And you love them and, and want to do good to them and you share your body. It is the most intimate relationship a man and a woman can have. It is not just physical, it is a spiritual relationship. And so for God to use this as an example shows the incredible love, but the incredible pain he feels when his people will turn from him and go to other gods. And so God comes to Hosea Hosea does marry a harlot. Her name is Gomer. Now, 
I tell you, we've talked about names before, but that is an unusual name for a woman, Gomer. They were married and they had three children. And even the names of the children are names of great sorrow. The first one was Jezreel. And God says, I want you to name your child Jezreel because God is going to bring about judgment and it will be in the valley of Jezreel. It, Jezreel means God sows. God sows judgment. The second child was Lorahama. She is not loved because God will no longer show compassion on Israel. Now you might have children. Can you imagine living all of your life with a name, she is not loved? You see, you can just tell that there is such sorrow, such sorrow in the whole family. And then the last child that, was, that they had was Loami, not my people. Because God was saying to Israel, the day will come when you will no longer be my people and I will not be your God. So you see, it was a picture, a beautiful, tragic, sad picture that God was giving to his people. After they had been married and they had these three children, Gomer started a whoring again. And she became a harlot. You know, it's just amazing how when you're young and beautiful, you can just so enjoy the attentions of young men. And it appears to me that that's exactly what she did. She liked the control. She liked the admiration. She was young. She was beautiful. And so men were very interested in her. But it seems to me that she must have gotten older. You know, at 20, you can have a great relationship if you're just beautiful and it can be based on beautiful. But if that's all your relationship is based on, honey, it's going to be a short-term relationship. Because beauty does not last. And it, paired, it appears to me that poor Gomer was getting older because she began to move from adultery to becoming a harlot and she ends up as a slave. You see, the beauty has passed. And so now she is... She is a slave. And God said to Hosea, go to your wife. Go to the slave. Pay whatever it takes and bring her back into your home and into your love relationship. And Hosea, being obedient, did just that. You see, God is a God of judgment. But he is a God of love and he cannot stop loving and so he was saying, the day will come when I am going to buy you back. I'm going to bring you back into a love relationship with me. And there we will live in love together again. And Hosea brought Gomer back. God is still in the business of bringing people back from their folly and back from their sin and back into his love and his blessings. So what is this message in this little book? First of all, I think God goes to great, great extent to many words to say to his people how much he loves them. And it is not a little bit of love. When he compares it to the husband-wife relationship, that really is the deepest love human beings can have for one another. That is a very set-apart relationship. And God says, you are my beloved. You are my bride. I will lure you back into love for me. And that's exactly what he does. You see, he wanted the people to know that they could not live apart from him. And as we saw in the leaders, the, just themselves, it is amazing how much trouble we can get into when we turn away from the laws of the living God. God says, have no other idols before me. Now, ladies, let me just tell you what an idol is. It is anything that you set your affections on. It might not be a wooden pole sitting in your living room. It may not be crystals. It will may, may not be images. It could well be your wealth. It could well be your career. It could be your children, your husband, your family lineage. 
It could be tennis. It could be your exercise program, your beauty, your looks, whatever it is, anything that takes your affections away from the living God is an idol in God's economy. And he says, have nothing that will interfere with our love for one another. You see, these people were unfaithful. And that unfaithfulness was displayed in a lot of different ways. As you read this book, it would be a great idea for you to have a pencil and pen by your Bible. And as he talks about the sins of the people, write them down because you might be surprised and shocked as to what God calls sin. You see, they were first unfaithful. They were thieves. They took things that did not belong to them. They were murderers. Their leaders enjoyed the fact that the people sinned. Isn't that interesting? Now, why do you think the leaders enjoyed the fact that the people sinned? It's because the leaders would not have to feel bad about their own sin. And so the leaders encouraged sin. They were deceptive. They deceived one another. They had foreign alliances. Now, you might not think this is such a big deal, but God had said to the people, I am your protector. You don't go and pay other nations to protect you. You simply get on your knees and ask me, and I will protect you. I am your defender. I am the one who's in charge here. Don't spend your money on foreign alliances. And lastly, now listen to this one, ladies. This is a hard one. They were ungrateful. God says they did not realize that it was, it was the living God who gave them everything they had. And they had become ungrateful and they never turned to the Lord and said, Lord, it is you that has given me all of this. It is you that has given us the blessings. Thank you. Oh, I tell you, isn't it just amazing what ungrateful people we have become? And haven't you also felt sometimes like God does? that you have served and served and served and so wish somebody would just say, thank you. God loves his people to be people who are grateful. Well, those were some of the sins. And now God was saying to him, I'm going to raise up a nation and it is going to be Assyria and I will bring about judgment and you will be destroyed and some of you will be scattered and you will not enjoy my presence and you will not enjoy the land which I have given you. And that is exactly what he did. But as we've said over and over, God cannot leave his people alone for long. And so he gives a promise and this is the promise, ladies. God says to Israel, the day is coming when I will gather all of you up again, those of you who are scattered to the various parts of the world, I'm going to gather you up again and bring you back into this good land. And there again, we will enjoy the marriage relationship. I will be your God. I'm going to be your husband and you will be my bride. And I will shower you with great blessings. And never again will there be a divorce. Never again will we be separated. But we will live forever in the joy of each other's love. In the end, God says he will restore his people. And there are several things that he is going to bring back to them. First of all, they will multiply once again. You see, that was one thing, a gift that he had given them in the book of Exodus. We saw that those people had wonderfully healthy babies. But during judgment, infertility was a tremendous problem. God said he would once again bestow his great kindness on his people. He would pour his kindness out on them. He is going to reunite the northern tribe and the southern tribe so they will once again be one people. 
And he says he will be their husband and they will be his bride. And they will enter once again into that pure and beautiful love relationship. And lastly, he says loud and clear, I will be your God and you will be my beloved people. He is an awesome God. He is a God of such love that sometimes as you read his descriptions of his own heart in this wonderful book, it will almost make you weep to know how much God loves you. And he is a God who can restore the most broken relationships, the most broken hearts, and he can forgive the very worst sin because that is just the kind of God he is. This little book of Hosea is one that is very hard to read because of the sorrow and sadness within it. But within the sorrow, look for the great joy that God loves you.